On New Year's Day 2008, 24-year-old Meredith Emerson went on a hike up Georgia's Blood Mountain with her dog. The pair set out on the Freeman Trail, which links up with the famous Appalachian Trail that hikers can then follow to the summit of Blood Mountain. On her way up, Emerson encountered an older man, and the two allegedly ended up hiking together for a short while. Eventually, though, Emerson pulled ahead and reached the top of the mountain without the man. But at that point, she was only halfway. She had to then turn around and go back down the mountain. And of course, when she did, she once again encountered this old man. But this time, instead of hiking with her, he was waiting for her with a knife. Gary Michael Hilton was the man's name, and after kidnapping Emerson and also trying to use her ATM card, he would go on to violently end her life. And as the world would soon discover, this was not the first time that Hilton had targeted hikers deep in the woods as his victims. Gary Hilton was in the middle of a multi-year killing spree, stalking parks and trails from North Carolina all the way to Florida, and he would ultimately be proven responsible for four homicides. However, many people suspect that his killing spree went well beyond four victims, and we may never know the exact numbers of his carnage. This is the story of Gary Hilton, the National Forest serial killer. So, Excuse me being a little blunt here, but I'm just gonna come out and say it. This guy is obviously a total piece of human shit. Like, it's a crazy story. I'm gonna jump into it, but first, I would just like to ask you to please subscribe to this channel. If you enjoy hiking mystery stories like this one or other hiking, backpacking related content, I'm trying to get the channel to 200,000 subscribers. Please help me get there. I would appreciate that very much. And all right, this is a, this is a tough one. Let's get into it. Gary Michael Hilton was born on November 26th, 1946 in Atlanta, Georgia. He was an only child and he was raised in Atlanta until 1958, at which point his family moved to the Miami, Florida area. Not that much is known about Gary Hilton's childhood, although we do know that at age 13, he shot his stepfather. So... Yeah, we're already off to a pretty bad start here. Fortunately, his stepfather survived the shooting and he even declined to press any charges against Hilton. And again, I'm not really sure what all the details are surrounding this incident, but clearly in hindsight, this was a huge red flag. In 1964, Gary Hilton joined the United States Army where he served in Germany and received his GED. While serving, he began to experience a plethora of mental health problems and was ultimately ultimately sent to a psychiatric hospital. He was treated for some time and then ultimately in 1967, he was honorably discharged from the army. He was essentially cut loose, a young man with a violent past, severe mental health problems, and now extensive military training was now roaming the streets unrestricted. For the next 40 years, Gary Hilton bounced around between Georgia and Florida, racking up numerous charges such as DUI, theft, drug possession, and even arson, although it's not super clear to me if he was ever convicted of that one. In addition to all these arrests, he had also gone through three divorces by 2007, so clearly this guy had a troubled past, a lot of problems in his life, and it seems as though by 2007, Gary Hilton was ready to take his life and his violent tendencies to a whole new level. On October 21st, 2007, 80-year-old John Bryant and his 84-year-old wife Irene went hiking in Pisgah National Forest southwest of Asheville, North Carolina. They parked their car on Yellow Gap Road not far from US Route 276. What was supposed to be just a normal hike for the couple would end in pretty much the worst possible scenario. After leaving for this hike, the Bryants would never be seen or heard from again. After two weeks went by, the couple's son was not able to get in contact with them and so he reported them missing. Shortly thereafter, investigators discovered the couple's parked vehicle, but no sign of the couple. They didn't know what happened. Maybe they had gotten lost in the woods somewhere. Maybe they had been attacked by an animal. Nobody knew, but the case did take a disturbing turn when investigators discovered that Irene had actually attempted to dial 911 on her cell phone on the same day that they were last seen and the same day that they had started their hike. Due to lack of signal, obviously, the call never went through. The forest was searched by cadaver dogs, numerous volunteers, and helicopters, but they found nothing. That is, until November 9th, 
2007. On this day, searchers found the body of Irene Bryant hidden underneath some leaves near the Barnett Branch Trail. It was clear that she had been killed violently, and so now authorities were desperate to figure out where her husband John was. It was soon discovered that one of John Bryant's bank cards had been used to make a withdrawal in Ducktown, Tennessee, and cameras at the bank captured images of a person wearing a yellow rain jacket trying to use the card. Investigators believed that John was being held captive by whomever had killed his wife. Nobody knew it yet, but time would later go on to show that the Bryants had been the first confirmed victims in a rampage from the National Forest serial killer. And his rampage would next take him to the state of Florida. On December 3rd, 2007, a few months after the Bryants had disappeared, co-workers of 46-year-old Cheryl Dunlap grew concerned when she didn't show up for work at Florida State University. That was her employer where she worked as a nurse. They reported her missing the next day and her car was located abandoned on US Route 319, just north of the Wakulla County line. A massive search party of roughly 180 people began looking for her, but they found nothing. But the authorities did find some evidence of something that had to do with her disappearance and I'm not gonna lie It is pretty chilling authorities recovered images of a masked person trying to use her ATM card then Nearly two weeks later, hunters in Apalachicola National Forest made a gruesome discovery. Just off of a Forest Service road, the hunters found the slain body of a woman who was later identified as Cheryl Dunlap. And it wasn't long after that that investigators alerted the public to be on the lookout for a, quote, unique looking green truck, which prompted the public to submit numerous tips. And many of these tips were about a bizarre homeless man who was driving a Chevrolet Astro van. No arrest was made at the time, but in hindsight, we can say that the public was certainly on the right track. And that's because it would later go on to be proven that this van did in fact belong to the National Forest serial killer. And then the killer struck again, this time on New Year's Day, 2008. This time in northern Georgia was the location of his rampage, Blood Mountain to be more specific. You really can't make this stuff up folks. Uh, Blood Mountain is literally the name of where he chose to attack next. It's a very unfortunate foreshadow of what was about to happen. Blood Mountain is located within the Chattahoochee National Forest and is a pretty famous mountain due to the fact that the Appalachian Trail runs directly over its summit. In fact, Blood Mountain is one of the first big peaks that northbound through hikers will cross. It's less than 30 miles into the trail. As many of you know, I hiked the Appalachian Trail in 2018 and I remember Blood Mountain very well. There's a stone cabin at the top of the mountain, there's some limited views up there, and then the trail takes a steep dive down into Neal's Gap, which is another very famous spot on the 2,000 mile footpath. Bordering the National Forest and the mountain itself is Vogel State Park, which contains side trails that link up with the Appalachian Trail, allowing alternate routes to access Blood Mountain. On the very first day of 2008, 24-year-old Meredith Emerson had left a note for her roommate stating her plans to go hiking. The University of Georgia graduate grabbed her dog Ella and traveled to Vogel State Park and hiked out on the Freeman Trail, which links up with the Appalachian Trail below the summit of Blood Mountain. At some point during her hike, she encountered 61-year-old Gary Hilton. Emerson and Hilton allegedly hiked together for a little bit, but eventually Emerson's pace was just too fast for Hilton, so she and her dog continued ahead without the man and eventually reached the summit of the mountain. Everything seemed to be going fine up until this point. But then when they turned around and started hiking back down the mountain, all hell broke loose. When Emerson and her dog encountered Hilton again, he was waiting for them with a knife. He demanded that she give him her ATM card, but Emerson refused and began fighting for her life. Hilton was later quoted saying, she wouldn't stop, she wouldn't stop fighting and yelling at the same time. So I needed to both control her and silence her. Hilton ended up breaking his hand during the struggle, but eventually he did subdue the desperate woman. Once again, he told her that all he wanted was access to her ATM card. Then he discreetly led her and her dog back down the mountain, avoiding any established trails so as not to raise any suspicion. And when they got down the mountain, he led them both 
into his van. When Meredith Emerson failed to return home from her hike, she was reported missing. It didn't take long before witnesses reported encountering her during her hike of Blood Mountain. And these witnesses also encountered an elderly man who was following her. Because of this, a description of the man was released to the public and tips soon began pouring in. After kidnapping Emerson and her dog, Gary Hilton began driving around various places in Georgia, south of Blood Mountain. He tried numerous times to use her ATM card, once in Gainesville, Georgia, and then again in Canton, Georgia, but my understanding is that he wasn't able to use it. In order to try and buy herself some time, Emerson kept giving Hilton incorrect PIN numbers to her ATM card. And it almost worked, because by this time, authorities were starting to close in on Hilton. One of Hilton's former bosses had actually recognized the description of the man that the police had put out. This boss also knew that Hilton would often frequent the woods around Blood Mountain, and so he kind of put two and two together and reported him. Around this time, the authorities were also starting to link Hilton to the murder of Irene Bryant and the disappearance of her husband, because Hilton's description and yellow rain jacket he was seen wearing on Blood Mountain matched what investigators had seen in the bank surveillance video of him using the Bryant's ATM card. So investigators were closing in on him and they were closing in fast, but ultimately they would end up being too late to save the life of Meredith Emerson. On January 4th, 2008, about three days after she had been abducted, Gary Hilton took her to the Dawson Forest Wildlife Management Area near Dawsonville, Georgia, and he took her life. The National Forest serial killer had claimed yet another victim. However, Meredith Emerson would prove to be Hilton's last victim. The same day that he senselessly took her life, his rampage would finally come to an end. After killing her, Hilton once again began driving around Georgia and ended up stopping at a gas station in the town of Cumming, Georgia to ditch incriminating items that would link him to the murder. Some of these items were Emerson's clothing, her wallet, and her University of Georgia ID. Hilton then began driving again, this time towards Atlanta, where he eventually stopped at yet another gas station. When stopped here, he began cleaning up his car, frantically trying to hide evidence by vacuuming the inside and washing the inside with bleach. As I said a few minutes ago, at this point, Gary Hilton was a wanted man. His face had been plastered all over the news, and because of this, for whatever reason, at this particular gas station, a number of people recognized him, called the authorities, and reported his location. It didn't take long before the authorities followed up, pulled into the gas station, and found him there in the middle of cleaning his van where he was arrested. Finally. But this isn't the end of the story because investigators still didn't know where Meredith Emerson was. And they were still in the process of linking Gary Hilton to the murders that had occurred in Pisgah National Forest. Three days after he was arrested, Hilton admitted to the killing of Emerson and led investigators to her body in exchange for a deal that allowed him to avoid the death penalty. This is the point where things really started to unravel for Gary Hilton. On February 3rd, 2008, John Bryant's body was finally discovered off of a Forest Service road in Nottahalla National Forest, and investigators were able to uncover evidence that linked Hilton to that murder and the murder of Brian's wife. And finally, less than a month after Hilton pled guilty to the murder of Emerson, he was indicted in Florida for the murder of Cheryl Dunlap. Gary Hilton would go on to be sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Meredith Emerson. Then a few years later, in 2011, he was extradited to Florida to face justice for the killing of Cheryl Dunlap. And in this case, he was given the death penalty. In 2012, the family of John and Irene Bryant received justice when Hilton was convicted of their killing as well. In this case, he was given an additional life sentence, but ultimately, out of all these sentences, the death sentence is the one that matters the most. And as a result, Hilton is sitting on death row in Florida still to this day. Though he was brought to justice for the four murders I covered in this video, there remains a large possibility that Hilton has not been brought to justice for other murders that he committed. Many people are suspicious that he was involved with the disappearance of Jason Knapp, who went missing after a hike in Table Rock State Park in South Carolina back in 1998. Gary Hilton is also strongly suspected to be involved with the disappearance of Rosanna Milani, who went missing in 2005 in Cherokee, North Carolina. Shortly before she disappeared, she had spoken to her father on the phone 
phone about taking a hike on the Appalachian Trail. And she was last seen at a store purchasing a backpack accompanied by an unidentified elderly man. And those are just two examples of potential disappearances or murders that he could have been involved in but was never charged or obviously convicted for. Let me know if you guys want me to do an update video going over some more of these cases in greater detail. We will likely never know exactly what the extent of Gary Hilton's rampage was, but we do know that it's over and that he will pay the ultimate punishment for his crimes. I'd like to remind everybody that while these stories are real and they are definitely scary, every single year in the United States, millions and millions and millions of people go hiking and are completely fine. It's good to hear these stories. It's good to have them serve as a reminder to always keep your wits about you when you're on the trail, but also never forget your chances of being a victim of a violent crime are significantly, I'm talking way, way higher walking down just about any street in any city. Despite these stories, I promise you that you are safe when you're hiking as long as you use common sense. My heart goes out to the victims of Gary Hilton, their friends, and their families. Thank you for watching. That was a tough one, folks. Um, if you're the kind of person that really likes these videos, you like the content that I'm making on my channel, I ask that you please go to patreon.com slash kylehaytiking and consider joining on there to help support this content. It's the best way to support this content, I will say. And I appreciate everyone who's already on there so much. You're essentially just buying me a beer every single month. One more time, patreon.com slash kylehaytiking. Go check it out, please. I would really, really appreciate it. And yeah, once again, thank you guys so much for watching.